Speaking of our American neighbors, I'm going to bring a great one in, and that's Spike Cohen. Uh, he's in the lobby there, and we're going to have a good talk. Hey, Spike, thank you very much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And no, we have no, as far as I know, anyway, we have no plans to invade. So No, uh, no, I, I didn't. Easy. You don't want this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh I, i'll give a, a bit of background on you too i mean you've been quite uh you know visible in social media and in a lot of media yes. throughout the states uh you ran as a vice presidential candidate for the libertarian party of the united states mm -hmm. uh, i'm gonna have the leader of the libertarian party of canada on tomorrow but our version of the party isn't nearly as well developed as you guys down there so i, I hope we can learn from you guys and, and get a, a better liberty movement going on up here as you can see we really need it Yes, yes, it, it definitely so. One thing that I, I don't know if this was mentioned before uh, I, I came on to wait for, for my segment, but uh, this is inadvertently causing a run on the banks uh, because part of this uh, Emergencies Act or War Powers Act, whatever it used to be called, uh, being invoked. One of the things is that they're going to try to find anyone who has given any kind of uh, uh, monetary help to the Freedom Convoy. Uh, whether they donate it on GoFundMe or Give, Send, Go or whatever the other site is, or uh, any other possible construing of giving monetary support to them, um, which is causing people to pull their money out of the banks. And of course, because you have the same type of fractional reserve banking system we do, uh, for every uh, dollar that's actually in the bank, there's actually uh, as much as 100 or more dollars out in circulation. Uh, so, you know, uh, or, or the money that they're holding that the banks claim to hold there's only about maybe a dollar being held um so it's not easy it's not hard to have a run on the banks typically they have just enough to keep what is a typical expected amount of withdrawals in in, in circular in their in their holdings but uh this could potentially cause a bank run which is going to cause a whole other set of issues especially during all the other uh, problems that are going on in canada yeah, as if we didn't have enough economic issues going on with this yes. whole pandemic, uh, that we just posted record inflation numbers again, which are just chilling with how fast that started. But everybody saw it coming. I mean, you're printing money like crazy. You're spending yep. like crazy. Any any economist worth their salt's going to say, hey, guys, <laughs> you're going to get inflation. And, of course, they're all pretending yep. they're shocked by it now. Yeah, I mean, as who always. Would, who would have thought that they'd come in and actually, that's what they're looking to do, is to steal your money. They, they, they want to come yep. into the banks and take your money. Of course, people are are moving it and pulling it out as fast as they can. And it's going to have consequences far deeper than they think. Oh, there's many different examples of this. Now, I realize that the honking and the, and the bouncy castles are a threat to the very sovereignty and integrity of the Canadian nation. But I, I do think that there could have been other ways to deal with this. One thing that, that keeps sticking out is Justin Trudeau kept saying every option is on the table. Well, clearly that's not the case, Justin, because there is one option that completely ends all of this and would actually have you hailed by the people that are protesting, as well as a good sizable portion of the country, uh, and probably have little to no effect at this point uh, on the the uh, the course of the virus or the pandemic. And that's just ending the mandates. If you believe that these vaccines are an effective way of stopping or slowing the uh, uh, the pandemic, Something like 80, 85 percent of Canadians are already vaccinated and something like 90 percent of the truckers are vaccinated. Mission accomplished at that point. Right. I mean, unless you're saying that you need that extra eight percent to get vaccinated or else it's all for naught. Uh, and of course, if you don't believe uh, that the, the, the vaccines are helpful, then, then you know, it, it doesn't matter. The mandate's not effective either. But either way. The, there's no need for a, a mandate unless, of course, you want to you know, plunge the country into further turmoil at, at a time of record high inflation, at a time of – it's funny. Talking about this, it's literally everything we have going here minus the protests. But the inflation and everything else, it's the exact same thing. Yeah, but I mean, one thing that you guys do have uh, stateside is uh, – I was talking to a, a, a political scientist actually prior to you as a guest – is uh, checks and balances. Like you were a nation built on a revolution. So you had a lot of things built into your constitution to ensure that people were protected from the government. We unfortunately sort of evolved out of the feudal system into the parliamentary system, and it still kind of keeps the, the state as being the supreme body, and, and we have to fight for our rights, and it puts us in a terrible position in times like right now. Absolutely. We're seeing that play out, right? The, the reason we don't have some of the stronger vaccine mandates uh, that, that uh, Canada has and other countries have is precisely because the state's 
or many of the states fought against it, took it to court. The courts blocked it. So there's there's many checks and balances, not just within the federal system, but then also within the 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 uh, uh, interaction between the states and the federal government. On the flip side of that, though, is Canada doesn't have nearly the brutal militarized police state that the U.S. has, or at least not the same numbers that the U.S. has. So whereas uh, we don't have the same types of uh, restrictions being put in place, if we were to have this kind of a a, even a, a peaceful protest uh, against, you know, a, a nationwide uh, attempt to blockade and protest, uh, this would be put down very quickly and a lot of people would disappear for several weeks. Um, so it, it, it's it's one of those best of time, worst of time things. But yes, this is a perfect example of the more you can frustrate government within itself and have it fighting with itself uh, over, you know, what powers it can and can't have uh, and actually incentivize politicians to grandstand against each other instead of us. That's a that's a better system. And, and yeah, that that does indicate that government's not a really good way of doing things. But it is what it is. The more you can have it frustrate within itself, the better for the for the people. Yeah, well, and I was saying earlier, I'm hoping that maybe out of this chaotic mess, we'll finally get the more critical discussion on our system as a whole, because a lot yeah. of it's failed on many, many levels right now. And yeah, your point's very good. Like one of the issues I think that led to the panic, and it is panic, I think, on the part of the prime minister as well, is that they realized right. they couldn't quell the situation in Ottawa. They, you know, the Ottawa police chief was saying, oh, we've got all the officers we can. They're, they're on overtime. They're tired out. And we have a, a, a microscopic uh, military force. So, I mean, they, even if they wanted to, they didn't really have the logistical means to, to be able to bring this under control. Exactly. And they still don't, even imposing this act. I, I, they're just hoping that if they can abuse citizens uh, economically, and, and uh, now they've leaked, uh, of course, our, our state broadcaster has been leaking the uh, information of people who donated to uh, those GoFundMe accounts, and they're starting to be publicly shamed. It, it's a frightening scene we got going on up here. It is very frightening. There's something I say very often. It's a common refrain of mine, and it's government power doesn't actually exist. There's what the people are willing to tolerate, uh, and especially in a country like Canada that doesn't have as uh, large and, and, let's say, robust of a militarized police state that exists in, in the U.S. And, and in China and many other countries as well in, in even greater degrees or, or greater proportions. Um, they can't stop the convoy. Like, literally, there's no violence happening. There's no revolution happening. There's literal bouncy houses and bounce castles and children playing in the streets. This is about as Canadian of a revolution as I've ever seen. I, I, I have to joke. You know, we, we, we joke that, you know, Canadians are, are polite to a degree we can't even understand. And, and here it is playing out. But, but in, in all reality, this is a uh, this is not a violent takeover or an insurrection or anything like that. It's like you said, tens of thousands of people saying, no, we're not going to leave. And the government is utterly powerless to stop that. And I, I'm not sure that the, the addition of the RCMP into this or, or the Canadian military is going to provide the numbers that they need uh, to be able to do that. I think they're banking on the, enough of the, the, the Freedom Convoy people just getting scared and stopping. If they were going to get scared and stop, I think they most of them probably would have already. So I think that this is going to potentially backfire in showing the entire rest of Canada that now you actually can just resist the government. There's not a heck of a lot they can do about it to you as a collective, maybe to individuals they can make examples out of, but that's going to uh, uh, have repercussions for your overall crime rate. A lot of common criminals are watching this. Violent criminals are watching this and saying, well, I guess we can do whatever we want. Uh, we don't have to be nearly as concerned as we used to be. And, and a lot of just everyday Canadians who typically just comply with a bunch of stuff that doesn't usually make sense to them just because it's the easier way to do it. They're looking around and saying, well, if they don't have to obey, why should I have to obey? There are many uh, repercussions, both good and bad, that are going to come when a, an increasing number of Canadians realize government has no real power other than the consent of what they're willing to put up with. And that has all sorts of uh, potential ramifications for the, the immediate and the future. Yeah, well, and a, a symbol of uh, how many Canadians stood up, and it's getting understated a lot, is, I mean, well over 100,000 people, individuals, donated to those fundraising accounts. Actually, yep. it's getting into the hundreds of thousands. <laughs> and in, in a nation of 30-some million people, that's very significant. I think it, was, it wasn't even the dollars so much. They didn't like that symbol showing this is much bigger than just the few people on that hill. Because some people, they couldn't afford it, or they don't have the time or the means to get out to a protest, but they want to support it. They're upset too, so they say, well, I'm going to toss them a few bucks. And now, like I said, we have the, the state-owned CBC that is actually... 
doxing people who donated to it. You know, somebody hacked the site and got the names of people and companies that donated. Yep. Like this country is getting divided, it, it, you know, neighbor on neighbor, family member to family member. Uh, it, it's uh, and our prime minister just keeps throwing fuel on the fire every time he gets an opportunity. I, I, I mean, he's he won't hesitate to call everybody who supports this movement a Nazi. He even called a, a Jewish member of parliament that yesterday, which uh, he won't apologize for. I, I, of course not. I, I fear for, for where we are going. I really do. Well, it, it, he has created a hill, and it appears he wishes to proverbially or die on it. I'm not saying literally die on it, but, but he's currently found his hill that he wants to fight on. And that hill is that this is a fringe minority of people with unacceptable views, almost all of whom are racist and Nazis and homophobes. And I, I remember he put out something about homophobia, transphobia, and anti-Semitism, and that that was condemned uh, by what, what was being done by the by the, the convoy. And I said, who's even brought up trans people during this? Like he just threw out every phobia or ism he could against this. And and but the narrative has always been this is a small, exceedingly fringe minority. Well, if that's the case, why can't the entire government of Canada stop them? And yes, uh, of, of a percentage of the Canadian population that's actually out there you know, refusing to leave. Yes, that's a small minority, but that's true of protests in general. And this has been going on for weeks. And the sheer amount of support that they've been getting, yeah, this is fringe minority is not what this is. Um, and and what's been very striking to me is that, you know, the part of the narrative has been, including in the US against this, has been, well, 90% of the truckers are vaccinated. So clearly that means that, you know, the vast majority of truckers are against this and the vast majority of, of, of Canadians are against this. Well, most of them were coerced into doing so. So you're you're saying, oh, well, you know, 80 percent of this population uh, complied with being forced to do something. Surely they're not against being forced to do something. I think that, uh, we've seen that a lot of the people that are out here are saying I'm vaccinated. Some of them are even saying I chose to get vaccinated. But this needs to be a choice. People need to be able to make informed, consenting decisions on whether or not to get vaccinated or any other health decision. This is a personal decision. You know, we this is a perfect example of, of a fight for bodily autonomy. And I, I even my opinion about the vaccine is irrelevant, you know, that we should support people's bodily autonomy. Well, it comes down to the liberty issue. That that's that's where of course you're the ideal guest to talk about with that. And I'm one of those. I support this convoy. I love seeing citizens standing up and pushing back. And I'm vaccinated. I chose to be. Yep. And uh, I never for a second want it to be not a choice for somebody else. And don't you dare try to speak on my behalf and say I don't support that convoy. I exactly. will speak for myself on that. And lots of people do. And even of those, you know what, 10 percent, 15 percent of Canadians who have chosen not to become vaccinated. Well, that amounts to millions of people. So. As a national leader, to dismiss such a large segment of your population, to villainize such a large segment, to divide them, that is terribly irresponsible, uh, and that's not doing your, your job. Yep, it is, and, and and it's increasingly on anti-scientific terms, which is ironic because all they ever say is, you know, data and science. Well, data and science shows us, uh, from what I've seen, that the vaccine is safe and it is, a, or generally safe, and it is generally effective in preventing severe illness. The Omicron variant has proven that vaccination rates are not going to have anything to do with whether this virus sticks around or not. Uh, if the Delta variant hadn't helped drive that home, the Omicron variant uh, breaking all previous records for case numbers uh, in, in North America and, and around the globe, despite the highest levels of vaccination we've ever had, it, it doesn't stop the pandemic. And so the argument that you're, you know, it's a public health issue and you're a bad person if you don't do it. And, you know, we need to force people to do this in order to stop the pandemic. That is patently false. You are a well past the Canadian population and the trucker population, especially, is well past any number that would cause herd immunity if the vaccine was actually going to stop COVID, stop people from getting it and stop community transmission. So even if you think that bodily autonomy should be contingent on the greater good or public health, which I, I do not. Uh, I think that uh, any attempt to mandate someone's uh, personal decisions that don't directly affect someone else uh, are always going to end poorly uh, and are inherently immoral. But even if you did think that, we know that's not the case with this. This should There is no good argument for this not just being a personal health decision to be made uh, under informed consent or, or lack thereof. No, I mean, if it was working like crazy, it would still, uh, as I, likewise, it would grate on me to say you, you can impose this on people. 
but I, I, there would be a bit of justification if they say we're wiping out this whole thing, we're we're dealing with it, it's working. And it's there, not. There'd at so, least be an argument, right? There'd yeah. at least be an argument, exactly. But there's nothing. I had a commenter, uh, Kathy Wheaton, and she brought up a good point. Uh, we're kind of wondering. So you're hearing a lot about us with our insanity up here. Uh, has there been much movement with American truckers? Because there's a lot of unvaccinated American truckers who are de dealing with the same difficulty trying to come back and forth. We do a lot of trade with each other. It's very important to a lot of people. Absolutely. So there has been uh, quite a bit of talk uh, about a uh, American equivalent of a freedom convoy. There have been some small trucker protests. Th things are a little different in America in that uh, Canada, uh, both demographically and geographically, is very well suited for s several tens of thousands of truckers to shut down entire parts of the country. Uh, you have large population centers that have large uh, you know, you have just a couple of highways uh, that are um, uh, connecting them. You don't have these big uh, mega population centers that overlap into each other like we have in, in many parts of the U.S. Um, you uh, also have a very high percentage of owner operator truckers, much higher than in the U.S. So there's a lot of factors there that make this something that was a uniquely Canadian way of protesting and being as effective as it has been. With that said, I mean, yes, I, there's definitely there already are some trucker protests and truck and uh, protests in support of the truckers. I do think that we're going to end up having the American version of the Freedom Convoy. But for a variety of reasons, I'm not sure it's going to have uh, another reason being we don't have quite as strict of the restrictions at the federal level. At this point, there are, are very few restrictions at the federal level. So I think a lot of our protests will likely be targeted against specific states or even specific cities, uh, large major metro areas that have very high restrictions that are comparable to what you have. So I don't think it's going to be the same, uh, but I do, I mean, that we've are, we're already seeing some of that here. Yeah, well, and, and uh Something that might come about, I've had a lot of people, of course, debating on this, saying, well, you're wasting your time up here in Canada demanding this because the Americans have a vaccine policy as well, and the truckers won't be able to come back and forth anyhow, even if we lift the Canadian one. But that's right. a, in my view, it's a vacuous, two wrongs, make a right sort of argument. Yeah. Let, let's get rid of ours first, and it's going to bring a great deal more pressure about down there to get rid of that one as well. I mean, you have to start exactly. somewhere, and uh, we're uh, looks like we got a lot of people ready to start. Well, and, and we have been advocating from the beginning, you know, freedom lovers have been advocating from the beginning to end this requirement uh, that people come in, especially uh, uh, people coming in for work, not even coming in to stay, but coming in for a specific work related purpose, like a trucker that's bringing goods to and from uh, the U.S. and into Canada or onto the Mexican side as well, uh, requiring them to be vaccinated. Um, it, when, again, it, science and data, when you look at the science and data, the spreading hasn't happened because of truckers bringing in goods uh, or taking goods out. Uh, the spreads have largely been in, uh, uh, in two things, large events, very, very large events, and relatively smaller family uh, setups where, you know, someone's going into a, a greeting of or, or a, a meeting of maybe a dozen or so people in a small, poorly ventilated area, like a house. So, I mean, the, the things that they're that they're going, that they're fighting against are nonsensical. But that's like in the U.S., we have a uh, requirement that all healthcare workers now or effectively all healthcare workers have to be vaccinated. Uh, and that has led to a, a lot of layoffs. And so now, again, this was to slow the spread. And uh, now, uh, because of the shortage, they're now telling vaccinated healthcare workers who have active COVID infections that they have to come back to work as long as their symptoms aren't too bad. They literally have COVID. We're, we have to get rid of the unvaccinated healthcare workers, the vast majority of whom do not have COVID. And it doesn't really seem to matter all that much, at least, whether you're vaccinated or not, whether you can spread COVID. But we got to fire them for public health. But we got to bring back the vaccinated COVID work, the healthcare workers. I guess we can call them COVID workers, healthcare workers that have COVID and can much more easily spread it to someone than someone who doesn't have COVID. It's nonsensical. It makes no sense. It only makes sense if you look at it from the filter of, what creates more power and control for government? Then everything they do makes sense. If you try to make it make sense under their terms of why they say they're doing it, it looks like they're a bunch of fools. And I, I don't think they are fools. I think they just want more control. Yeah, well, that's it. And you're closing off on exactly what I wanted to say. I mean, this is obviously not about health anymore. It's about control. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. always that the battle actually comes down to when it comes to citizens versus government anytime. And this has brought it to a head. I just hope that we 
fight our way out and maybe into more liberty. I still always got to maintain optimism because uh, yes. otherwise I won't be able to sleep at night. Absolutely. Tough go. But thank you very much for joining me today. Where can people find more information on where you're at and what you're up to? I see you all over the place, seeing you on Fox and, and other such spots, but uh, where can we keep track of you, Spike? Well, so if you're looking for me on social media, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on YouTube, I'm on TikTok for the kids. If you look for Spike Cohen, you'll find me. Uh, it, my website is spikecohen.com. Um, and that also has a, uh, a listing of upcoming events. If you're if you're in the States uh, or if you're vaccinated and in Canada and want to come down to the States, uh, then uh, then you can come out to an event. And I'd love to get to meet you in person. Um, but, yeah, website is SpikeCohen.com. And I'm Spike Cohen on uh, all the major social medias. Excellent. I really appreciate being able to talk to you today. I hope we uh, get the chance to do it again soon and uh, keep fighting that good fight down there. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on again.